we wanted to find out a little bit more about Agria Equine Insurance because they have come on board with the Eventing Podcast. They have a brilliant message to share. And I'm delighted to say Vicky Wentworth, Chief Executive of Agri UK is with me. Vicky, am I right in thinking that there's also a service that enables you to speak to, without it affecting your premiums, a vet that will give you guidance and advice on actually the next steps that you should be taking? Yeah, so we were really lucky. Actually, last year, we launched something called Agri Vet Guide. And um, it's a model that sort of exists in lesser forms in the UK currently. So um, there's many opportunities where you can phone a veterinary nurse with your insurance company and, you know, get some advice on the telephone, etc. We actually decided that that we needed to go one step further. We have the Agri Vet Guide app is you can book an appointment. You can book it literally within 10 minutes if there's availability, you know, so it's really, really fast. It's immediate. Um, and you can video call with a vet. So for me, this was really, really important because it means that if there is something happening, you are very unsure of the next steps you might want to take sometimes it's minor yeah for sure you know you can but sometimes it might actually be more serious so you're quite difficult we don't all have a view of what our horse might um, be doing when it's colicking for example Um, or it might be lame you might have got on it and thought ah, you know what it doesn't feel quite right today feels a bit footy perhaps the gait isn't quite consistent you know, you can stick it on a lunge and you can talk to it. You can have it on the video talking to a vet. So the vet is then very able at the end of the line to to be able to substantiate whether they feel, given what they've seen, your animal needs to go to the vet straight away. So you absolutely need to make a call or whether, in fact, you know, you could bide a little bit of time. You don't have to go for an emergency call out. You don't necessarily have to do it on a Sunday. You could do it on a Monday. So all of these things just allow customers to make, I suppose, more careful and considered decisions about how they then go forwards and treat their horse. All about horse welfare and actually speed and access. You make a very good point. Can you avoid that emergency vet call out fee? It is massively useful. Okay, it is time, listeners, for another horse of a lifetime, uh, brought to you by Agra Equine Insurance. Now, today's guest is always one of our most popular guests on the show. I thoroughly enjoy recording with her. Peggy March, how are you? Hello. Yes, um, all very well. Thank you. Looking forward to the winter to go away. (laughs) (laughs) We're on Um, for dry, dry weather this year. That's what we're on. Yeah, spring, sunshine. Exactly. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, I have a feeling I know which direction this is going to go in, but who is your horse for a lifetime? Yeah, I think you do. You have guessed correctly, and it is indeed Veneer Chimera. I don't think um, when I've only won two five stars, and it is on um, both the same horse, both Badminton and Burley, that I I think I couldn't not have her as my horse of a lifetime. She's unbelievably special. Tilly, baggage. She has many names. Baggage. Um, Where did baggage come from, actually? Well, firstly, we're quite good at nicknames in our camp. I think maybe I'm scarred for life because I have a really (laughs) bad one. And um, I've had to live with that always. Um, That, I don't know, something between our our team and our gang here, most things end up getting getting nicknames. Um, Her stable name is Tilly. Um, We called her Tilly Bean. Um, Then she's sometimes Bean Bag. Or she's runner bean when she goes fast cross country. Um, she is she is a baggage, or she's um, a velociraptor in her stable. Sometimes when she gets very fit, so bag yeah baggage. <laughs> um, but it's obviously a t- term of endearment because she's um, she's always been much loved. But um, yes, she's got a few nicknames going on there. I think everybody has a few nicknames, just not everybody owns up to them all all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Take, us, take us back to the start of her journey. Trevor Dickens owns her, still owns her now. Yeah. Uh, she came to you as a relatively young horse. So what were your first impressions? How old was she? And what did you make of her? So I think she was 
seven when she came to me and that was in 2012 and it's a really interesting time actually it's an interesting time looking back on my life my system how you know I was working the yard and everything I was I was based on my own I was incredibly busy young and hungry and had you know probably 25 plus into event and it was also the London Olympic year Trevor came as a very new owner um I didn't know him at all and I was very much at the stage that I said you know yes to any horse any stable empty needed to be filled and so I was just very busy she didn't leave much impression on me. She was a a very weak, backward seven-year-old. She hadn't evented. She had been a pain in the backside to break in and get going. She moved okay. Type-wise, yes, she always had the blood and she was always a very brave horse to do things. But she was just so very weak to sit on. Um, She was pretty Mary. And she only really loved, you know, she could only really go on the bit for sort of five minutes and she was very back, neck sore and, you know, felt a little bit um, awkward, but didn't leave much impression. You know, she she still went through the motions. She jumped, jumped. She was quite flat in her jump and in her feel. She didn't feel the scopiest. Um, She just didn't really leave me with much impression. And... I think um I think I did a few events on her. Um a few a couple of nineties. I think she won her first ninety on a <laughs> twenty score or something. Um and then and then did a few hundreds and then I think I finished that seven year old year with two novices and she had a couple of show jumps down, which she really felt like she sort of headbutted them. And um, but always cantered around the cross country quite, you know, she was brave and she always felt like she was going to be fast. Um, but you know, the interesting thing was, um, and I do find it very interesting, but I was at the stage, you know, 2012 was the London Olympic year, and um mentally I found that pretty desperate really you know it'd been the the aim for the last few years the focus of the whole year was around that and to lose two through injuries of like six weeks and three weeks before the games when your life evolved around that and it was our hometown olympics um i didn't love that particularly um and so you know and a lot of things spiraled from that loss of sponsors loss of Some other owners may be thinking theirs might be next. Quite a bit of like backlash sort of thing came with it. And I'm quite a sort of quiet, maybe insecure. I don't know. (laughs) Or like, you know, I take it personally, probably a bit of a girl like that. So um, you try to do the best you can. You want answers and all the rest of it. And I found it just quite a hard time to be tough or brave sort of thing. And so... The winter of that year came and I thought I would just try and downscale a bit and sort out my business. And obviously Trevor and Vinay Kamira um, were, and Trevor was with his wife, Steph, at the time, who he lost a few years later, really sadly. But at that time, they were the one of the last people to come on board. I wasn't close to them. I didn't really have a relationship with them And they were one of the first I had the conversations to to say, look, I'm really sorry, but I'm scaling down. Um, There's only so much I can do. Um, It's just me. And it's I would like to scale my business down. And I remember them saying, you're you're giving up on one of the best horses. And I kept thinking, really? (laughs) I'm not so so sure about that. But anyway, um, anyway, best of luck. Um, and so she went straight to Izzy Taylor the following year. So she was then an eight year old. And Izzy took her from having one point with me at a novice to, um, you know, well in advance. She got to advanced level, won at advanced level, and I think competed at Blenheim eight and nine year olds that year. Um, and I was just in awe of watching her. Never, never for one second did I sit back and think, oh, well, I made a crap call or why did I say no to that? I was I was genuinely, I enjoyed 
watching them. I was I was interested. I, I think Izzy's is a fantastic rider and, and so brave and just gets on everything and off she goes. And I'm not. I wouldn't be like that. I funny around a lot more and not to <laughs> train a lot more and get, you know, the relationship is very important to me of with the horse and we're all so different. But I thought Izzy was, you know, she was brilliant. Off she went, her first novice galloped on round flat out and she was fast everywhere and just kept you know picking up prizes the whole way and got to Aston eight and nine year old and was the only one inside the time and won the class I watched with in awe of them both to be honest and um, I think I I'm not sure at the end of that year they then took her away from Izzy because they were concerned that Izzy didn't have turnout, which I thought was was strange at the time because she'd done so well, um, but didn't think that the horse was then going to suit um, her establishment. So I remember saying to Trevor, I think you're mad. You know, look, she's flying. She's doing really well. And the lovely thing is, as I always stayed, or the nice thing is I always stayed in, in touch with Trevor. There was never, you know... Um, there was never words or anything. It just wasn't for me at that at that time. And he asked if I'd have her back then. And I was like, no, <laughs> I couldn't do what Izzy's just done. You know, that is like, I never got that feeling from her. And Izzy and I are very different riders. And Trevor, you're, you're absolutely mad what you're doing. You know, she was she was flying. It's like, no, the system's not right. Anyway, I think she got tried by a few other top riders. Um, and it wasn't, she wasn't for them. And then ended up with Paul Tapner. And again, I very much watched in all their, their progress. Um, and she very steadily and well just climbed the ranks, was it? you know, four star long. I think he did a couple of them. And before we knew it, she was at Badminton. And um, I was intrigued, but still never, there was never one day that I thought I made the wrong call because you we all get our own feelings that we get from a horse that you think, yeah, I like that. That excites me. Or I think I can work with that. Or the horse feels happy with me. Or, you know, all those sort of things is where I'm a proper girl, that I like that that feeling or that, you know, to feel that I was doing my job well, the horse was happy, the owner was happy, rather than it ever being just a job in the way, I'll just take the livery and I'll just ride another horse. But I'm always very interested. I love to watch because I think you always, you never stop learning. And I will always love to know what other people did with a feeling that maybe I didn't get or just just something like that so I continued to watch in awe and she did badminton with him um and she was clear cross country I think she was a bit steady I can't I can't remember you probably know the form a lot more than what more than I do Nicole I think and then well, and she completed she, Burley in 2015, had 20 Was that the first five-star? So it went Burley, Babington and Burley, yeah. Yeah, then she went to Babington the following year and finished top 20. 6.8 time penalties, which... Yeah. Okay. Still, like, probably a bit slower than she went round afterwards. Um, yeah. Still pretty quick. Yeah. yeah, still pretty quick. Yeah, good girl. Good girl, so that was top... Top 20. So, yes, she got to Burley the first time with Paul and had a run out at Discovery Valley, which was such a shame, um, just at the end. And then went to Badminton and, yep, yeah, finished top 20. And then she went back to Burley with Paul um, the, the same year as he was at Badminton with her. And he sadly had a fall off his first horse, which crunched him and he wasn't able to ride her as his second horse. And I remember watching, I wasn't riding at Burley that year, and I was watching, you know, longing to wait to see her go. And I was like, oh, God, how annoying, how annoying. So I sent Trevor a text to say that was really annoying. Um, you know, when they're fit and well and ready to go, hope Paul and everyone's OK. Well, then afterwards, Paul actually tired. And so Trevor made the phone call. And I think Trevor and I joke quite a bit because I think he probably asked me four times after she'd left in 2012, whether I would ride her, have her back and ride her again. 
And I kept saying, no, no, Trevor, you're mad. Honestly, she's fine where she is. She's flying. And it was after I'd just had Max. So I'd had my year off and I was coming back um, into it that winter. And I didn't really have so many. My numbers were well down and I was quite, I was stable again (laughs) mentally and ready to get going. And I didn't have, you know, many top horses. And the winter was a great time, you know, just after Burley, I said, look, I can, um, I will try her for a while and just see, you know, it's not every day you get offered a five star horse. And actually, Paul was absolutely brilliant, because I had a really good chat with Paul just to make sure he definitely was retiring and I wasn't stepping on any toes because he had done the majority of, produ- you know, producing this horse at this level. And I didn't want to, you know, get my snout in unwelcomed anywhere. And and secondly, to chat to, to him about her because, you know, I said I had her as a young horse and she didn't really give me any feel. You know, I've just had a a kid I'm not the bravest of riders I'm not I'm not an Izzy that could just get on anything and and fly about I like to I like to train I like to understand I like to think I have buttons and and so I was very honest with him of like did you get an all right feel because as a young horse she's very slithery she's like divey and she never really felt scopey he's like without doubt she's a five-star horse and you do not get the feel until you get to the major big days and sure enough that was really very true even to the to the very end um and that voice was in my mind you know the whole time I took her on um and she was the same horse but very different there was there were similarities when I had her back but um she was clearly a more mature horse and and had found some strength What are the Um, challenges when you take on a horse at that level, at five star level from another rider who's obviously, you know, hugely successful and has has done a brilliant job in producing them? How difficult is it to take on a horse that actually is already at that level and isn't one that has come through your system from the very, very start of their career? Well, I don't actually... I don't mind that. Um, I don't, it's not ideal. It's obviously always nicer to know everything about it and really have that trust and partnership. But it's, it's sort of something that hasn't really, I've quite enjoyed that over the the years and been some of my most successful horses have been ones that I've taken on at an older age. But the only thing that was the difficult thing about that is, is changing their systems and their plans and their, shoes you know so injuries can be a little bit sometimes more prone to that because you're you're changing systems feeds various structures you know fitness regimes gallops you know all that sort of thing and so that is something that I I really try and take into a lot of account but I personally have quite enjoyed that or it's been lucky for me anyway but I think it's something again, maybe coming back to not being the bravest of people. If so, if someone, if it's already done something big and good with someone, and they said that was really good, I get quite a lot of confidence from that. And I think with Paul saying it's definitely a five star horse pick, and I was just like, God, I just couldn't have felt that as a, a weedy young horse. And so um, she was a bit. She was quite mental. She was quite a hot, highly strung little thing that got, got very, very hot and sweaty very quickly and quite um, a bit stressy. Um, she didn't really eat. They'd, she'd sadly been involved in a in a lorry crash, so she didn't. She sweated off, you know, on the way traveling to events and wouldn't really eat. So it's just trying to get her to, you know, be comfortable, be happy, get a bit of weight on relax a bit she got quite stressy in the warm-ups the show jumping collecting rings you know she she barely got to doing a warm-up fence before she could go in because of just atmosphere or the noise of the clapping or the stress of, of sometimes would be she just went in the ring and jumped around and and there was bits like that that I wanted to try and that for me was quite important to try and iron out so that winter with not having you know it's a but classic of not having too many horses and just being able to have the time. I put her on a wagon, a small wagon, took all the 
you know, the two partitions out of it. So she had the run of the place to see where she, how she wanted to stand to travel. Um, and that helped her quite a lot because she would just stand in a partition and every time you even remotely went to go and touch the brakes, she would lean right down, like right down to the floor. And um, it was all quite stressful. And she'd arrive at wherever she was going in a fairly sweaty mess. Um, then get there and relax. But it's like, this isn't, you know, all the feeding work you do to try and make them, you know, obviously help with ulcers and all that sort of thing. You feel like all those few weeks you've done, you then suddenly lose it all in one journey. What um, did you learn? You say you you love to learn. You obviously had followed her career. Yeah. What did you learn from Izzy and from Paul that actually was then instrumental in... <laughs> your success with her um to trust her trust the the feel that it was very low it was very truffle snuffly and divey you know it's not your your ideal feel at speed um over big solid jumps um but she was a very she is a very very intelligent horse and she knew exactly really where her legs were and and I think, you know, Izzy said a couple of times we very nearly fell because she was flying a couple of times. I think Blenheim was one and somewhere else and and clipped the top and very nearly fell. And, you know, but Izzy said, I remember speaking to her when I wrote my book about her. It's like she was a mare. The mares are the ones that fight for you. And she wanted to stand up. But Izzy probably taught her awful lot you know I have a lot to thank I probably never would have approached that fence at that speed and been that brave and thrown at it and she she clobbered it and stood up and it probably made her always be a little bit more self-aware or or careful or stood on a feet she probably taught her a lot more than I I probably would have done at that stage I, I don't know who knows but she said, you know, she was a mare, she was a fighter, she wanted to stand up for you and she um, she actually loved it. And I think she genuinely did, to be honest, the cross country. 2017 was your first full season back with her. She went on to, I mean, she was second at Burnham Market in the three-star short format earlier on. Then she went to, to Bramham for the long format three star as it was then four star as it is now finished sixth at Bramham then went to Burley and finished second as runner-up in in 2017 at what point did you get that feeling that you had been told was there and actually you were like no she is the real deal here yeah okay so that would have been Bramham and my OIs and four star shorts before Bramham felt pretty yucky (laughs) to be truthful I was like this is exactly the horse I thought you were as a young horse um and you know very dive I've got pictures around Osby and think it's like oh my word she's basically landing at the back of the fence and truffle snuffling her way round. she wasn't the easiest horse you know to get her settled to try and get the weight uh you know she was prone to tying up she was just still quite merry um I was like oh gosh you know getting to Bramham I think I trod on a stone so I said bruised bruised her little flat feet and I was just like she was trying to tie up and I was just like oh my word this is you know it, it, it all comes with a lot of baggage anyway some of these <laughs> <people, and laughs> <is, laughs> yeah and I walked the course at Bramham and Bramham is you know it is a five star in some ways I mean some five stars don't walk as big as Bramham sometimes in my opinion and the terrain and everything about it the beefiness the old-fashionedness of it and I remember walking around there going oh my god we had to run downhill to this upright coffin under the trees in the wood and I was like this is going to feel hideous and and so I was like right I'm I'm going for this I'm going to go and have a go and if I if I don't like it I'll say to Trevor you know, this one is just not not my bag. I don't feel like the big jumps and me go to go together with her. Um, but there was something of a of a, the three day and the big track. She got into bigger rhythm. She she found scope 
easily and she settled she went for those 11 minutes or something and just got into into a groove and I galloped down the hill set her up for the coffin and she nipped through it as nimble as a little cat and gave a really good feel at it you know a really careful I was sat there like going, oh here we go and I was like oh well done good girl I was you know that was nice <laughs> and then carried on to um I think I then got to the main water and again we did find some pictures of it um but for some reason I don't know what I I obviously missed like a good or something in the middle of the main water but from the first part to the second part there was clearly a half stride or a dodge or I don't know what it was but there's a picture of me underneath this massive box brush um in the water and I remember at the time just getting it to going what distance is that because that isn't one thing or the other and sort of dropping the reins but sitting up and putting a bit of leg on and being like do you know what love if you if you want to have a go I'm with you but if you want to stop and run out I'm I'm with you too because I don't know what we're going to do here and she left a leg and she literally turned herself inside out to get over it and pricked her ears to sort out there was another one of these bloody great big box brush things straight afterwards as a C part and how she stood up got you know organized kept going kept looking for flags kept believing she did you know so climbed over all those two in the middle and then popped out over the D with her ears pricked and was like come on ma'am next one let's go and I was just like holy hell um what was what was all that about um you know you give a big big pat but I was like that horse was incredible to do that she wanted to do it she busted a gut to stand on her on her feet um and I don't think I'd have sat on many in my time that were were capable to do that but kept believe you know didn't get rattled by it um she just knew what knew what she was doing and and so then you know I came to the finish and was like that was a was a really good horse um and I grew a lot of trust in that that was just something that that there was something began a a partnership definitely began of you know sensing each other's dreams and and taking you there or whatever that feeling is that you get you know we're only as good as our horses and you need that feeling from a good horse and that was my feeling to then start believing and thinking right let's um let's start dreaming bigger or have a go at this there was something about this that was um something I hadn't thought that I could have felt from her and it was definitely something that I thank Izzy and and Paul for because I don't think I would have carried on myself over the smaller tracks or the younger weaker days um believing that that was actually possible it's it's funny, isn't it, that I always love to kind of look at that sort of sliding doors moment as to was there a moment that you can pinpoint as to actually yeah. the moment that it all came together. And it feels like those three elements in the water at Bramham were yeah. that moment you both because you trusted her, but actually she trusted you enough to say, I've got this, and, and off yeah. you went. Looking, looking back, she, you know, she never went on to give you real feel in the the intermediates the open intermediates and and the kind of the lower level preparation runs but you found a system that very much worked to get her to the big ones in kind of peak condition yeah now how much do you think she just thought or did she ever just think do you know what that's not really worth my my time like I want the big stuff (laughs) at this point do you think that was actually just what she was really trying to say um she could have done really um, there was definitely something of the big three days and that cross country day that she just she settled and she just breathed and just got into rhythm. She was really quite nappy at one days in the start box. You have to really manage that. You know, she just got herself quite worked up. But three days she would, you could manage her a lot easier to just be in the warm up and wander on down nicely enough to where you've got to go. You know, there was a system that you managed. Well, one day she was always quite a pain in the backside to, you know, I always had to get someone to get a number down on the board and tell me when there was one, you know, I just had one left to go um, and would then 
trot or, you know, she'd even nap it from the lorry park a bit, you know, from there, which at the three days she really, she really didn't. And so she would, she would just get quite hot and quite sweaty and just be, you know, get herself a little bit worked up. Some days were better than others, but the bigger three days she settled. Every time I set off Babington and Burley and you do one, two, three, and they're, you know, normally there's a table at events two or three or something at these events that are bigger than what we've jumped all year. You know, and she just would eat it and find the scope and be, you know, in an element. She'd prick her ears. She just loved the people, you know, going through the crowds and then, then giving her, you know, the cheers or something. It was like she thought they were there for her and would would just grow grow from it extraordinary we're going around a you know three back fields with no one there I think she's sort of like so what, what yeah. am I doing this for what what am I yeah, going to do how big is she because she she's, she's 16 frightened. she's 16 one I think it says 16 Trevor always says she's 16 two it's like I don't think so she's she's 16 <laughs> 16 one on her on her tiptoe she feels about 15 three when she gallops with a picking up her truffles <laughs> when she gets <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to that first five star win. Badminton 2019. 2018 had been a fairly heartbreaking year. She had had a fall up in Giuseppe's water, I think I'm right in saying, yeah. and going beautifully. And it felt like a bit of a freak thing and um, yeah. wa- wasn't sort of characteristic of her at all. So coming back yeah. in 2019, and actually that event as a whole, I mean, she she scored what? 26 in the first phase she'd been getting yeah. better and better two seconds mm-hmm. over the time cross country mm-hmm. and a clear round in the show jumping and again it, it mm-hmm. was a thing that she didn't always sort of she, she wouldn't be a horse that you would look at and she'd kind of give everything a, a foot of air and and right. make it dreadfully easy but right. actually it seemed to know when it really really yeah. really mattered. Yeah, I was glad I was on her and not watching her, I think, for the <laughs> show jumping phase. I wouldn't have... I mean, Trevor always believed, oh, of course you jump a clear round, but I think all connections watching, when you watch, you slither over every pole and probably give a rattle of most of them, that that was not comforting watching. Yeah, that was that was a, a special week. And I think 18 really, I was so upset by 18 because I felt that was her year. It was a wet year. She was flying around that tough track, absolutely flying. Yes, her weakness maybe got the better of it. That was a divey fence downhill into the water, which she always went into water, but she had quite often just like hold her breath slightly. So um, she just definitely did a dive and clipped the top of it. And it brought her down properly. Um, bless her, but she was absolutely fine. But I really thought I'd missed a, missed a chance there. And actually, Classic Moe won that year. And she was on a 28 dressage. And I think Tilly Bean was on a 25 dressage that year, maybe. And I just kept thinking, I've lost. That That would have been my chance. That was my, my only chance. And you know, baggage was a gritty little mare like Molly was, and um, which was, and, and it was a brilliant result. You know, I'm so I was delighted for Janelle. It was a very well deserved, much deserved winners there. Um, but I just kept thinking, I've missed, I've missed my chance. So, um, and 19, I went and I just got back from Kentucky with another horse I thought could have done really well at five star, and I just a couple of things slipped away that year. At, at Kentucky with Quarry Crest Echo. And I kept thinking, oh, I'm never going to get close to one of these things. It's just, it's really, you know, it just doesn't happen. And she did, I think it was quite an early draw at Babington that year, um, number 32 or, or something, I think I was. And she did a, br- a brilliant test, but it's just a clear round. Um, and it was quite interesting watching for the next two days, all these incredibly fancy horses come in and I thought oh this will go ahead this will go ahead but they just made a couple of mistakes and they just snuck in behind so I was like oh um and I think she was quite really quite up there maybe third or fifth or something after after dressage and around the cross country she stormed you know good old Tilly being really gritty I thought I'd done the time but two seconds over I was quite good at doing that to be honest but um yeah that was pretty 
pretty special. But to be honest, I never really believed we could win. We went into the show jumping still seven penalties, I think, behind Oliver. Um, or maybe it wasn't quite. I, I can't it remember. Was pretty yeah. close. It came down to, I think he had a rail and 1.6 time penalties and he could afford okay. one, a rail and 1.2 time penalties. Yeah, I know. Um, but you'd put the pressure on. You'd done everything that yeah. you could do by jumping clear. Yeah. What, what is it like watching and feeling in that moment at a at a five star and and kind of it being that close of a margin um well to be totally honest I was um I was really very happy when I jumped um the clear obviously I was amazed that it had I I thought I woke up on Sunday morning and thought oh you know could could I get close and and then I went and walked the course and was like absolutely not um this is enormous and just very square loads of related distance lines and she always gets more and more on her forehand if I've got lots of turn backs I can just balance her to get back on her back end a bit and get the front end up a little bit but loads of loads of lines and related distances I was just like not in a million um and and so I I remember jumping the last fence and turning to the clock and I mean I was only point you know two hundredth of a second inside the time um and so it was you know it's the these margins are just like just so minute but I remember looking at the board and it just came you know naught 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 like no rails no time or something I was like oh my god and um I cantered off a bit more and and sort of just leant down her neck to give her a pat and I just I was just like I sort of said to her I can't believe you just did that I cannot believe you just did that and you know just gave her a cute little pat and was still just in so it's shock I suppose and then sort of people were clapping and then I just like inside I just burst and I just like stood up in my stirrups and punched the air to think like get in it's just you know it took me a few minutes but I'm you know a bit steady anyway but it took me a few moments to just think We've actually just jumped clear. And I punched the air and every, the crowd are just like brilliant. They just like all like got well excited and cheered more. And so I punched the air again. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is brilliant. This is brilliant. And to, to be honest, I'd, I had won my my own personal event. I felt we'd won our own personal event whatever the outcome I never thought for a second Oliver wouldn't win that but we put ourselves in the game I was unbelievably proud of the little horse I just like you know your heart goes out to what that what they can do what they actually know sometimes and what they can give to us on just on days like that and I came out of the ring and you know Thomas was there Ames was there and I hadn't seen my little boy. Obviously, I went to Kentucky. Maxi was three years old or something. I went to Kentucky um, without him, came back for badminton. Thomas had been looking after him and came up for the weekend. And I, I, I find that hard. I'm a home bird. I just like, but it's just doing the right thing for him. He was very happy. I needed, this is my job. I need to focus, I need to concentrate. And and so he was there. He came with my well, God his godparents, Tommy Howe and Helen Howe to come and watch. And I was like, don't let me see him until I've done my show jump round because I just need to stay in my my bubble. And so when I came out of the ring, you know, I stood stood back and he came running over. And it's just like, oh, God, he's, he's like modelling over anyway. But it was just a really, <laughs> that, was, that was a a happy pill moment you know what when it's just like nothing could get any better it's just like I had the biggest squeeze cuddle from your kid and he was so pleased to, to see me and I was just like oh god it just doesn't get any better than that and so to be honest I didn't even watch Oliver I was just sat in my own I didn't right at that time I didn't really care I'd done everything I possibly could the horse had given me more than it I was just oozing the pride of a I was happy I'd got my little boy there you know Thomas had been there to support Ames was there you know it's a great team and there's just you know sometimes there's just special moments like that that just mean mean a load anyway and you know I'm, I'm quite used to finishing like a lot of us are used to finishing second to town end quite a lot so I was just like I was I was happy you know we'd done all we could 
And um, and so we were sat there chatting and Claire Balding was sort of 50 yards away. And then the crowd went, ooh, you heard the sigh that there was a rail. And so I was like, I knew we could have a rail. And then someone was saying, I think he's going to be slow. I think he's going to be too slow. So by that time, I was just sort of like, oh, is he going to be too slow? So then I was just watching the corner of the screen and it was like, I thought he was fine. Obviously, you would, you know, a quarter of a second is like a quarter of a second. It takes over at that last moment as well. It did. Like it's and, that- and it really did. It was like fine. And then not and the thing went red you know and the thing and his number went two you know from one to two and Claire was just like you've won and I was like oh my god I've won I was like oh my god I've won anyway you know you can clearly imagine oh my god I won um so all hell broke loose really and um you know the support was the support was amazing really it was very you know very very exciting all round it was a feeling that was overwhelming to be totally honest and um without doubt one of the best days of my life it's so interesting that actually one of your best the best days of your life and and kind of career highs at at that point came from a horse who'd actually seen you at one of the hardest times of your career um you know what seven years previously 2012 where things had been really tough and and listeners, I will just say we we talk about London in a bit more detail in when Nicole met Piggy, which is a show we did a couple of years ago. It's still one of my favourite shows we've ever ever done on this podcast, Piggy. And every time we we release it or we share it, people go wild for it. So go and listen to that. Oh God, did I cry? No, did no, I cry? no. It's just fascinating Excellent. insight into actually the ups and the downs and everything else. And I think you you summed it up really well then. Of You were amazed by what the little horse had done for you, the family kind of being around and and being part of that moment. That actually that's that's what it's all about. And and the result the result and and that the result is amazing and brilliant and justified and everything else. But actually, those things are the things that really, really matter. Um, They really are. And I think they really are. Horses can bring us all together. You know, those great days, it really can. There's a lot of rubbish days, but I think all of us that are associated with them can all say we've had some of our best days of our lives when things have gone well. And they've been family days or the horses have been there. And it's, it's been, it's been amazing. And the, the only sad thing was Trevor had um, lost Steph a few years before his wife who obviously I, I started riding Tilly for them both um, and so that was we always find that sad that she wasn't there to see it I, I know she would have been jumping up and down looking from up high down to and been very excited as well but that was um, she was much missed but they are without doubt very special family days as well. Did Tilly know? You say she loved the crowds, everybody came for her. Did that win give her something extra and kind of vindicate her belief as even more? She definitely knew. I think, you know, at home you noticed that more. She was she became a real um poser for people. You know, she was always quite a snaky thing in a stable. It's like we needed one of those, you know plaques on the front that's like enter her own risk or be <laughs> or whatever it might be because like she'd she'd bite me on a regular basis or you know it's just like snarl at you when you walk past and you know the teeth would come out and it's just like you know what watch her. it's not all just you know threatening um and the moment there was there was someone that she didn't know or just people walking around or a camera or anything she would stand and just pose and you know pull very beautiful faces of smiling and and just you know it was extraordinary she just knew that you'd just bring her out for a photo shoot or something and she would just say yep look at me and you wouldn't have to chuck anything to make a prick her ears or or something I found that was quite strange and she continued to do that for any photo shoot or or anything and um you know, if there was an, enough of a crowd, she was like, "Yep, yeah, that's that's all for me." Um, but she'd still know, she would still know when she went to somewhere, you know, in the 
back of the field somewhere. It's like, really, why do you why do you bother bringing me to these places sort of thing? And would scratch around grunting at me, swishing her tail and putting her ears back going, really, do I have to do this? And um, so she was a she was definitely a character, but but definitely knew she was a very intelligent horse and she knew when it was the time um, and we're not. I can attest to the smiling for photographs listeners. Piggy, you had her on tour with you last year and I was a proper fangirl. I was like, must have a picture with Tilly Bean. She was sort of heading off to, to go and do um, dressage in her retirement and everything else. I was like, must have a picture. Didn't even think for a second she might nibble or anything yeah. like that. And she stood for the camera and she smiled so beautifully, ears pricked, yeah. first shot. Yeah. Um, and I was as happy as Larry listeners, as you can imagine. She she did eight five stars with you. She was top five in seven of them. Uh, the only one that she wasn't placed in is, is the one that she had that fall in at Badminton 2018. Like her record was absolutely extraordinary. And one of the things that we've talked about on the Horse of a Lifetime series with our career is very much about partnership. The two of you obviously had a very, very special partnership, but how you managed her over the kind of heading even in towards the the later years of her career and how you developed that she had a very specific sort of way of working at home and I know Nini was massively involved in it and Ames managed her beautifully as well just give us an insight into actually sort of how bespoke that was to her and how important that ultimately was to her finishing her game at the very very top yeah I think um got to understand what she like liked I mean she definitely our days involved around baggage really you know she was the the first and last horse you know Ames often joked saying she could have a full-time job just being employed to look after Tilly Bean of all her special needs but you know one of the biggest needs was she she lived out you know, as much as possible. Um, she was a very independent woman. Um, she had the biggest field, which was actually our cross-country jumping field in, which had really good grass everywhere in it. It was massive. And she was the only horse that went in there because it didn't have mates around the edge of it. So um, she could be there totally on her own. She didn't eat the cross-country jumps and she didn't run up and down the fence at any point to say, I want to come in. She was just happy being on her own, being being left out. So that worked. Um, she was out at night during all the summertime you know, spring, summertime and out, you know, during the day, the whole rest of the time. She didn't spend too much time in the school. Um, I, I got a dressage saddle on a once a week max. You could irritate her a bit of overdoing that at the big at the big show. She was still a, a you know, blood horse. She was a bit downhill. She still always had that tendency that she didn't want to hold that uphillness for too long, too much. Um, it was definitely a slightly manufactured, you know, place that you get her to for the real top top scores. So it had to be very carefully, carefully managed. And yeah, my sister was brilliant with her because she gave her. She used to do a lot of just rides, you know, go around and do the fitness rides and do a lot of her work out and about. And without me bouncing around on her back, getting stressed, that does she feel good enough to get back to a a dressage test you know back to badminton back to Burley with the pressure on and does she feel like she's going to do a 25 or 26 again because she actually never felt like that um she never felt like that was you know that was going to happen but that was to be honest and fair to the the horse and there'll be very few you know they're few and far between but she she also took me places. Yes, we had the partnership. Yes, I got the training. We had the understanding. The whole team worked around her together, looking as good and feeling as good and being as happy physically as mentally as possible. But she also didn't let me down. You know, she would go in a, we would do what we could together for the dressage test. But I don't think in all the five-star tests she did, she never missed a change. She never got hot or or she felt like she was going to at times but she just never let me down she would try to hold it together she would try to just keep punching for you all the way to the end and 
you know, I kept thinking some days, oh, that felt on eggshells or, oh, that was better. Did that really look all right? Because I felt like I was, you know, crooked and not comfortable or and they're like, no, no, it's really good. You know, she she just delivered again and again in those, you know, she she must have she must have averaged, you know, she 25, was, 29 in her. She was sub 30 with you at every five star you guys did. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the things I was actually going to ask you was, it's so interesting hearing you talk about actually you managed how much you did train her, particularly towards the latter end of her career, because actually it's about finding what makes a horse tick. And that partnership, again, it comes down to that. And she obviously enjoyed that. Her best ever international test of her entire career came up early in, yeah. in the last five start. And it was a 22.6. And she, yeah. You know, she just managed to keep picking away with really good scores. She did. Um, and she was brilliant. And I was so glad she did get a PB at that, that age because she had come better. We also had friendly judges. I mean, she was a very good girl and I was very, very proud. And yes, it was a PB for her. Um, but the judges were glass half full that year. You know, sometimes you go somewhere and it's like, what do you have to do around this place to get them to smile or go, a, you know, <laughs> six point five or so? You know, just sometimes you get those events that the judges are keen to give you a good mark if something's good. And that Burley, we had g- good judges for that, so I knew if she delivered the best she could do, that they would be on her side. And um, and she did you know it was a that was a special moment because um you know I knew she was getting you know 17 years old she'd done a she'd done a lot how many chances was I gonna get to get back to get back to Burley and she hadn't won it and she'd been second twice I think and fifth once with me and so I was um I was pretty twitchy that I wanted to try and get this done yes that was that was pretty excited that's that set us off in good stead that did of a 22 that year in terms of the the burly win um you know horse of a lifetime she's given you your first five star win but am I right in saying that actually burly for you growing up was very much always the one that was kind of on the bucket list and the one that you really wanted to win how much did that victory mean to you and, and change and impact your career yeah, I think I grew up. We, I come from Norfolk, so just um, not far from Burley, and it was always the end of our summer holidays to go to Burley before we went back to school. And so I've grown up thinking that that was the event that I always really wanted to win. Babington clearly has the history um, a bit more, and probably you hear more people say that. But there's something about Burley that was that was closer to my heart maybe or just knew it better or was spent so much more time there and also Burley to me I think is is the toughest five-star cross-country course because of the terrain and there's there's something you know they've got to have heart and guts to just dig dig deep up and down those hills and get get the time you know not many get the time around Burley it's everybody knows that and so for me, it's the ultimate cross-country challenge. And, you know, this um, Tilly Bean was the, the ultimate cross-country horse of just heart and courage and grit. And she had done some fabulous performances around there. And I knew this year was probably at her, her age and things was one of the last times that I get this this chance. And so... Um, I knew she got there in good shape. It was a hell of a, a course, a really good track. It was, and um, and she felt on good form. So I, I felt that um, I was just desperate, not really to to let her down. And I was just praying that she would just do what she'd done. She'd loved Burley, and um, I was just praying that it was she would grit and off she'd go again. And and she did. I was just frantically trying to do some mental maths and calculate actually how many seconds over the time she was at five star with you. So from seven completed runs, I think it was something like 15 seconds over the time, cumulative across them all. Yeah. Yeah. 
an incredible record when you take into yeah. account the fact there's uh, four Burleys in there, a bad, a couple of yeah. Badmintons, a Victor, you know, that is just yeah. absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. Um, what was it about your partnership with her that made it so successful and made it so special? Oh, God. Um, I don't really know. Um, I don't really know. I mean, she was she was a very special little mare and I just felt she she believed in me probably more than I believed in her to start with and she you know she is just you know I often thought she would have done this with anybody because once I set her into those gears off she went um and I feel you know she she hit a lot of show jumps but she tried to keep them up she she wasn't the easiest on the flat, but she went in each time and tried to deliver. Um, I think the two of us just tangoed, but it was you know in the in the end. But it was her that I think she believed in me as much. She sensed my goals and was like, "I can take you there." Because there's plenty of times I feel from the horse, other horses, and would be like, come on, we've got to do this. And they don't do that last bit. There was something unique of her that gave so much to me that I can't put a finger on it or say I necessarily, I trained her no different to all the other horses or just went into the same thing. But she gave an extra whatever percent it is that said, I'll do that for you and and made it happen and you know what is that you can't train that you can't buy that it's just a a very special animal and she was without doubt exactly that she has the had the most incredible career so many people have loved watching her so many people have kind of invested in her journey as well um and i know that your your badminton win in 2019 I don't think I've seen a, as popular a badminton winner or a five-star winner as that year ever. It was absolutely incredible. Um, she has actually, given the impact that she has had on your career, um, you and the team actually put pen to paper and, and sort of encapsulated why she has had this extraordinary wow. impact and and given a little bit more context to her story. What, what brought about the idea of the Veneer Camera book? Well, actually, I I just wanted to do it. And it was, it's obviously no money making thing at all. It was just something that was very close to my heart. I grew up, I've got so many autobiographies of riders and, but more of horses and horses of different sports as well. Some race horses, some show jumpers, and, but obviously more event horses. And I grew up being obsessed with the sport. I grew up watching Babington and Burley for as long as I can remember. And um, I love my books. I would still flick through one now or take one on a holiday now and just see if there's things that I can learn from or things that relate to horses I've got or, or all that sort of thing. And never for a second did I think that I would actually write one about um, a horse that I rode. And so generally the writing on the back, the back of the book was me totally saying never in a a million years that I think I would be writing one. And but I'm I'm so proud and I want to share the story. I think it's a a the words on the back sum it up. I think she's a little horse that so many people can relate to. Um, She's a normal, a very normal little mare. Um, she doesn't ooze ooze presence or super movement or super jump feel or just a just a normal little horse that just wouldn't strike you in any way like some of the other superstars can do. But not all of those horses can say they went and won badminton and burley. And she just had something between her ears and between you know in her chest that was different to others that not everyone can relate to and as quirky as she was and as funny as she was we found ways and and she took me there and it's it, it's as freaky as that but it is um it was a fairy tale in in many ways it's hard to explain it but I think the the bad and the funny days 
of not not believing and all the rest of it and then all coming to at the end is is unique and something that I was I was just very proud to share. She may be an ordinary horse but she had an absolutely extraordinary career and impact on your career and and on the sport as well I think it would be fair to say. I think you're very humble Piggy because I think your impact on her and um, your partnership was a massive, massive part of this as well. But um, if you want to go and read the Veneer Camera book, I can thoroughly recommend it, listeners. Uh, I think it's piggymarch.com uh, and there's a shop on there where you can um, purchase it. So if you'd like to go and have a look, go and have a look. There's some great photos in it as well, some great memories. Um, Piggy, thank you so much for sharing the Tilly Bean story with us because she is such a fighter she is such a little warrior she has been I guess the real advert for a proper traditional tough as old boots five-star competitor Um, and we have thoroughly enjoyed a little walk down memory lane she finished at the very very top of her game she retired officially last year and and sort of um has enjoyed a a piggy tour swan song um But actually, she's got baby baby Tilly's on the ground who are the next yes, generation. Yeah. yeah, but she's also, Tilly Bean was a, a classic little mare. She was scratchy. She was snarly. She was, you know, everything that you know that mares can be a pain in the backside with. But also, when you get on your side, they're the, they do a hell of a lot for you and more. And so she was the total example of a good mare through and through. You wouldn't have ridden many mares at top level, I think I'm right in saying. No, not 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 five star level, but then I've not ridden as many as you think at five star level either, to be totally honest. I don't think, or maybe I have, I'm not sure. But no, it takes yeah, it takes all... a good few. A good few to us mere mortals, <laughs> listeners. There's been lots. Um, <laughs> like, no, not really. I mean, you know, yeah. um, you've just won a few five stars, and <laughs> I haven't really. I haven't the usual, really. but no, no, not ma- not many. Definitely more geldings than than mares, but it's just how it goes, really. And it's interesting as well, just to to point out, when she won Burley in 2022, she was only the third mare to win Burley in the event's history. Um, so Maid Marion won it and Hedley Britannia won it. And then, of course, Veneer Kamira. So, you know, yeah. it is a tough old thing to do. Um, yeah. Piggy, thank you so much yeah. for sharing your horse for a lifetime. Veneer Kamira, we love you. And thank you for all of the, the very, very, very special memories. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. This podcast is supported by Argria, the company behind the UK's only lifetime equine insurance. Their mission is to raise the bar on horses' lifelong well-being, and they offer up to £10,000 of vet fee cover year after year for life. Their Horse for Lifetime competition celebrates the horses who enrich our lives. To find out more, search for Argria Horse of a Lifetime, where you can enter your horse on the Agra website or catch up with Agra Equine on Instagram and Facebook.